All right, welcome, welcome everybody to the community information session. My name is Libby Baki um, with Barney and Worth, and I will be facilitating tonight's meeting. With me here tonight is also Tammy and Kim um, to help. Next slide. Um, the meeting is being recorded. Microphones are muted, um, but you'll be able to ask questions and interact using the raise hand feature on uh, Zoom and also on chat. Um, there is time after every topical se session, uh, section of the presentation to ask questions. Um, and there's also plenty of time at the end if we can't get to all your questions. Um, during the presentation, we've set aside plenty of time at the end to get your questions and comments. Um, and all the questions and answers tonight will be included in the meeting summary. Next. Oh, and also I should tell you when you're using the chat feature, um, you can send questions at any time and Kim Marshall here, she will be uh, monitoring them and re reporting them to the group. So anytime a question comes up, please put it in the chat. And how you do that on, on Zoom, there is a menu bar, um, a black menu bar and you can see chat. It's about halfway in the middle of the menu bar. You click on that. A chat window pops up, you type your message um, into the box there under where it says everyone and you you push the arrow, the send button, and um, everybody will be able to see it, and especially Kim who's Jeff going to be monitoring. Goodman. Join the meeting. Next slide, Tammy. Also to put your hand up, again on the menu bar, you can see um, a button called reactions. So if you push that, um, you'll get a window that pops up and the raise hand is the button on the bottom. So you will put a little yellow hand by your name and Tammy's gonna be monitoring that and we'll call on you during the Q&A session. Next slide. Now I'd like to introduce Martha Bennett, uh, Lake Oswego City Manager and Mike Jordan, the Director of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services for a welcome. Martha. Thank you so much, Libby. I appreciate it very much. And thank you everyone who's come out tonight to talk about wastewater. It's pretty remarkable that you'd be willing to dedicate time in your busy lives <laughs> to talking about stuff that we all just hope goes away. <laughs> but I appreciate very much all of you being here. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I've got at least one elected official in the virtual room. That's Councillor John Wenlin. I know that Mayor Buck and Councillor Manns are going to be attending in a little while, and um, they just need to be a little bit late to the meeting. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about why this project is on the city's docket, and then I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague at the City of Portland, Mike Jordan. Um, this project is really came about um, when we understood that to meet the uh, current environmental standards, the current wastewater plant, which is actually owned and operated by the city of Portland uh, in Lake Oswego's Foothills District, needs a pretty significant and pretty expensive upgrade. Um, and not only that, it needs to also expand. So uh, the plant, current plant takes around 12 acres and it needed to add another acre and a half to two acres to meet uh, current environmental standards. And at that time, uh, a lot of folks in Lake Oswego started to ask, well, is this a really wise investment? Because once we invest millions and millions of dollars in the current plant, we know we're gonna continue to live with it. Could we uh, deliver high quali higher quality wastewater? Could we reduce our other environmental impacts like smell or uh, energy use? Could we be a better neighbor for the folks who already live or work in Foothills? Uh, could we take up less space in Foothills so we can make this very valuable land available to the community for other uses? And could we actually keep our current rates at or below the estimated costs for these capital improvements? And so because we were curious about these questions, we decided to evaluate whether a new plant might be a better way to deliver wastewater treatment services to both the folks who live and work in Lake Oswego and the customers who live in the city of Portland. And I think tonight you're gonna to find that as we explored the potential, we think the answer to all of those questions is yes, that we think we can actually deliver better quality water back to the Willamette River 
We think we can reduce other environmental impacts. For example, we can lower our energy use and we can also reduce odor and other neighborhood impacts. We think we can reduce noise. We think we can build the plant on a smaller footprint so that other land is freed up, land right next to the Willamette River. And we think we can do this cost effectively so that the folks who are paying rates um, pay no more than they would if we upgraded the current plant. We've had a really strong partnership with the city of Portland. We've worked together for decades now and they've been an incredible um, partner in this exploration uh, of something that I think uh, two and a half years ago, I think seemed a little um, risky, but now I feel like it's gonna actually end up delivering a higher quality product for, the, for, for both communities. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Jordan from the city of Portland and ask him to make a few remarks. Thanks, Martha. Uh, appreciate the time uh, all of you giving me on the agenda. Um, yeah, I, I uh, will echo some of what Martha uh, has mentioned. I will admit that when uh, folks from Lake Oswego first approached us regarding uh, this project, uh, we were pretty skeptical and we had done a lot of work on alternatives analysis on the current plant. Uh, for upgrade. We knew it needed to be upgraded. Uh, and uh, upgrade probably isn't robust enough a word for what needs to happen uh, at the current Tryon Creek plant. It, it really needs practically to be rebuilt from top to bottom. And as Martha mentioned, expanded also. And so um, after <laughs> our folks uh, got over a bit of skepticism and really started to crunch the numbers about what was gonna be necessary and get more real than a facilities plan level estimate of the cost, um, we decided that if in fact, all of the things that Martha mentioned, uh, the environmental outcomes, the technical outcomes, the financial outcomes uh, of being able to build a brand new plant could be realized, then uh, this, uh, endeavor was actually going to be a benefit to both communities. Um, we're uh, uh, enthusiastic about the uh, uh, progress we've made to this point. Um, I want to thank uh, Anthony Hooper uh, and the team that he assembled for Lake Oswego and the team of consulting help that were assembled uh, to first of all do the preliminary kind of work to put together an RFP and then the analysis of those RFP proposals uh, to get to the current uh, partnership, I would call it, with EPCOR. Um, and uh, I, am a, I am now a point where I'm optimistic that all of those criteria uh, next spring uh, will be able to be met uh, and will be able to come back to both city councils uh, and hopefully be able to move on to the contract phase uh, for construction and permitting of a new plant. The jury's still out. We don't know the, all the answers yet. That's what this first preliminary services agreement period is for. You're gonna hear a lot about that tonight from people who are experts in their fields. Um, uh, but again, I think uh, Next spring, I think we will have uh, what we need to make a rational decision uh, for both communities about whether to proceed with the uh, public-private partnership or not. And, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to, to making progress on that. I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank uh, particularly Jim Brown from our staff and Amanda Haney, who have both worked really hard to be uh, Portland's voice on some of the technical and permitting issues that come along with uh, either refurbishing the plant we have or building a new one. And uh, again, I'm, I'll just close in saying, um, uh, kind of skeptical about two and a half, three years ago, but over the course of that time, um, I think the two cities have developed a really strong partnership in being able to, in a transparent way, uh, understand each other's interests and analyze those interests and come to conclusions that really I think will benefit both cities. So again, happy to have a little time on the agenda. Really appreciate that and looking forward to the presentations. Thank you. 
Next slide. So what we are going to do next is use the Zoom polling feature to see who's in the room. Um, this is um, one so we can see who's in the room, but we'll be doing more polling later. So um, you can let us know if you have any questions on how to use it. And you can do that in chat or raise your hand. But Tammy, do you want to get the polling going? And this yes, is for I'm, everybody. Yes, I'm going to launch the poll right now. Okay, so um, this um, question is, um, what best describes you? And then there's a number of choices. You can just click on the one that best describes you. Um, you might want to, um, Tammy, do you want to pull down a little bit as there are some options below what we can yeah. see? Okay. So there's interested community member, neighboring business or properties, neighbor association, member of city advisory board or commission, member of interested organization, project team member, contractor, P3 industry representative, elected official, and other. And it looks like we've got 75% of people have participated, 77. So I'm going to end the poll now. And then I'll share the results and we can take a look. And it looks like 37% are interested community members. And that's followed by, we have a really broad group of people here. Um, the highlights, uh, project team members, and then I would say interested organizations in the community. That's uh, fantastic. Interested community members, um, um, interested in uh, the wastewater treatment process. Again, that's um, fabulous. We have such a great turnout here tonight. I'm gonna stop with, sharing this poll. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie. Awesome, thanks Libby. Yep. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight and taking the time to learn more about this project and hopefully to share your thoughts. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Martha and Mike for your opening remarks um, and, and you're welcome. Uh, my name is Katie Kirkland. I'm a citizen information specialist with the city's engineering department. And my role is to manage public outreach and communications for our, our major infrastructure projects. Some of you um, may know me from the current Boone's Ferry Road project and the Lake Oswego Tigard water partnership project. Also presenting with me tonight are Anthony Hooper, uh, deputy city manager and project manager and lead for the project. Jill Jamison from Illuminati Infrastructure as our public-private partnership advisor, and also Lee Ward from EPCOR, who is a senior project manager. Next slide, please. So we have quite a large multidisciplinary team behind this complex partnership project, made up of representatives from, from several different organizations. And some of those listed here are also attending tonight. Um, if you're on video, folks um, in the project team, please raise your hand as I mention your, na your names. Um, Erica Rooney, Jim Brown, Daniel Baylett, Kevin Conway, Rebecca Stenham, and Dan Lafitte. So thank you for being here tonight. Next slide, please. So before we jump into the meeting, I'll just go through a, a brief overview of, of what we're going to discuss um, as far as the agenda this evening. Anthony and I will cover an overview and a, and a background of the project, discussing how we got to where we are today. After that, we'll jump into some topical presentations where Anthony will present on some of the good neighbor elements um, and the benefits to, to, to the project. Jill will also outline how the project is being delivered and Lee will focus on treatment technology, sustainability and the environmental benefits um, for the project. And before we move into each topic, there will be an opportunity for feedback and questions after each section. So feel free, as Libby mentioned, to throw them into the chat or to put your raise hand up um, after each topical presentation. After that, Libby will run through some of the interactive group polling um, for guiding principles. And then this will be followed by another opportunity for broader discussion and general questions and comments. Um, and we'll close with um, our great elected officials here this evening. Thank you for joining us. We've got uh, Lake Oswego Mayor Joe Buck. We'll have Councillor Jackie Manns and also Councillor John Winland. 
Next slide. So some of you are here tonight and you might be wondering why is a new wastewater treatment facility needed? Uh, as Martha already kind of discussed, the existing Tryon Creek wastewater treatment plant was built in 1964 and it is owned and operated by Portland Bureau of Environmental Services. It serves Lake Oswego, a portion of Southwest Portland and some unincorporated areas of Clackamas County and Washington, Town, Washington County, excuse me. It's, also, it's located at the confluence of Tryon Creek um, and the Willamette River in the Foothills District area in Lake Oswego. Um, this is a recent aerial image that was taken um, earlier this year. Next slide, please. So as you can see in this image, the current plan is aging and many parts of the plan are at the end of their useful life cycle. The facility needs significant investments to continue to reliably meet current and then also potentially more stringent Oregon Department of Environmental Quality permit requirements and also to protect it from climate change. Next slide. So before we invest in aging technologies and processes, the cities of Lake Oswego and Portland are exploring whether a new resilient and state-of-the-art wastewater treatment facility can be built to replace the aging Tryon Creek plant. One of the major decisions is, is, is determining if we can build a new plant at a cost that is similar to or less than the cost of upgrading, modifying and operating the existing facility. Anthony will go into a little bit more detail um, in a few more minutes about this. Next slide, please. So the benefits of a new versus upgrade. There are several benefits to building a new facility versus upgrading or expanding the existing one. A new state-of-the-art treatment facility will produce, a, will produce cleaner water and ensure more environmentally sustainable services at a similar cost to upgrading the existing facility. Our team will discuss each of these benefits during these topical presentations. With that, I'll hand it over to Anthony to outline some of the key decisions that have been made to date, um, how we've gotten to where we are, the rate structure, and then schedule before going into the good neighbor elements. Thank you very much, Katie, really appreciate it. And thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, I, I think this is an extremely exciting topic and, and not everybody shares that sentiment with me, but uh, I really do appreciate you being here and being interested enough to give up your, your day to, to talk this through. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, what I wanna do with this first slide is kind of give you a sense of how long we've been active in this project. And we first had a feasibility study done in 2018. And it, the study basically said that they, you know, that it's possible that a new plant could be less costly over a life cycle over a 32 year period of time than upgrading the existing plant. And what we're finding is that we're thinking that could, that's going to be true. There's still work to be done to, to, to verify that, but that's where, where it, we're heading. And uh, so over this period of time since um, June 2018, um, we have been to a council a total of 11 times. Uh, we've actually been featured in the LR Review five times. And uh, there's been a lot of due diligence that we've done since that period of time to, to now. And so we went to council in December 2018, where they gave us permission to move forward with the public-private partnership. And then we, uh, at that, at, during that period of time, we um, did a lot of due diligence. We actually went through a, a very uh, extensive procurement process, and uh, that led us to um, basically um, uh, to where we are today. And um, so uh, leading up to that, um, we uh, had an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Portland uh, that that kind of dictated the terms for this period of time that we're in. Um, and uh, and we uh, came to a preliminary service agreement with Epcor Foothills Water in May, 2021. And they're our public-private partnership uh, 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 entity. Uh, and uh, Lee Ward will will talk, and Jill Jameson will talk about that a little bit further uh, down in the presentation. Um, and then um, we, um, uh, also have um, uh, selected our, the technology, which is Aqua and Rada. And uh, the technology is, is really dictated a lot by uh, the available land that's near the plant. And I'll talk about that a little bit as well. And, uh, and then there's one that I, I didn't mention, but I think a lot of you are probably interested in, which is the rate structure. And actually I'll talk about that in some detail right now. So next slide. So the main thing I wanna cover here, and, and actually uh, 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 Martha, 
uh, Bennett mentioned this at the top, is that um, um, within our existing rate structure, we have uh, uh, anticipated uh, needing to upgrade the existing plant. And the um, cost to upgrade, to build new, uh, is going to be the exact same rate impacts as if uh, we're going to upgrade the existing plant, and what we're what you see here is the typical monthly bill for the wastewater bill. Uh, and so last year it was three percent. We are now it's three point nine percent is what is it is uh, projected to be, and that covers uh, not only uh, the existing or the new plants, uh, either one with being you know, the same impact, uh, but also um, all the upgrades to the wastewater system, uh, all maintenance, all of our staff uh, in, in operating, um, all the different uh, items also are covered within those rates as well. And, uh, you know, once again, to reiterate is that um, within this already rate structure, the, the new plants already captured within what you see here. Um, uh, and once again, uh, either choice, if it's existing or new, this, this is what the projected rates are going to be. Over the long run, though, we think that it's a better financial impact to go with the new plant, uh, and but those those um, uh, uh, savings rates won't be realized till much later um, in the thirty year life cycle. Um, but uh, once again, I, I think this is a, a slide that I think many people are probably interested in, and I wanted to make sure that we, we showed that here. Uh, next slide. So here's the schedule for uh, what's upcoming. And uh, so, you know, we are going to um, uh, have another neighborhood meeting uh, in January and also a council study session. And at that point, we anticipate having about 30% designs completed. Right now, we're only at about 15%. So we're still very early in the design process and we're still working out a lot more information. There'll be more to come. Uh, and then, um, as you can see by the schedule, we're also going to have another open house and survey in February. And uh, we encourage you all to participate in that one too. Uh, there'll be uh, further um, things we can share. Uh, we hope to have renderings and other information that we can share at that point too. Um, and uh, then in, in May, um, we'll have um, our basically last public info session before we go to council to brief them on um, you know, the 60% design and we'll have a good cost estimates at that point. And we'll have enough information for the council to uh, make a decision whether or not to move forward um, into the pre-construction and, and final permitting stages of this project in about um, the end of June, early July. And um, so next, next slide, please. So there are a lot of benefits to this project. Uh, one of one of the main ones is it uh, has a lot of good neighbor elements, and one of them is that it's uh, the technology allows for us to build on a smaller footprint. And actually, when you look in the area around uh, foothills, there isn't a lot of land that's uh, contiguous that's buildable on that we could that that uh, we could build a new plant on. And we we can't um, we can't build an existing site because we need to have the plant operating while we're building. And so there will actually be a point where both plants will be operational um, at the same time. And um, and then uh, then once that's done, then we plan to. Um, uh, uh, demolish and remediate um, the the existing property um, uh, and um, so basically with a smaller footprint there's some really good um, uh, advantages that come to it so since it's about six acres versus the uh, 12.7 acres uh, that the existing plant is, is occupying uh, we can actually do some interesting things such as kind of make it look like a commercial building so next slide so here's just a, a, a rough sketch, but um, once all of the um, uh, the industrial processes uh, are inside of a building. So um, uh, uh, it, it's when you look from the outside, it's going to look like a commercial building, which is is quite a, a big uh, advantage. And uh, I think it will it will really blend well within the foothills area, and uh, and uh, it's going to allow for us to have more extensive landscaping and um, and. and uh, once again, it's not going to look like a wastewater treatment plant, whereas uh, the curtain one does. And this is a bit of an innovative idea that I, that I, that I think is going to work really well for Lake Oswego. Uh, and next slide. 
Another element is that because it's it's inside of a building, we can really do strong odor control. And so uh, I don't know if you're like me, but when I would go to uh, the foothills for concerts in the park during summertime and it's 100 degrees, I could really smell the odor coming from the existing plant. And it's it's quite distracting. Uh, and uh, this this project is meant to solve for that so that uh, next time that you're, when this is built, when you're there enjoying some wonderful music, you don't have to smell uh, the plant. Next slide. So another element of this project is uh, ability to reclaim riverfront. And, um, you know, this is a decision that a council, the council is going to have to make in the future of what do we do with that land and what does that become. Um, uh, this project, um, um, while one of the benefits is that it, it could free up uh, a portion of that, you know, 12.7-acre uh, uh, site, um, uh, we feel that um, decision um, to to build or not build uh, a, a new plant uh, needs to stand on its own merits. And, and while um, having extra land is uh, definitely plus, uh, that we don't, we don't want to use that to, to make this pencil out. I think it needs a pencil out on its own merits. Next slide. So at, at this point, I uh, covered a lot. Uh, there's only five minutes, but keep in mind that this isn't the only amount of time that you're going to have. There's going to be other opportunities for, for uh, questions. Uh, Libby? Yep. So um, again, um, put a question in a chat or hands up. Kim is um, yeah, monitoring I'm, the chat. I'm looking at the chat. Um, I don't have any questions yet, though. All right, Tammy, are there hands up? Are no hands up. All right, so I think we can keep going. On to the next topic. With Jill. OK. Anyone? Next slide. Yeah, well, so thank you, everyone. My name is uh, Jill Jamison, and I've had the, um, the honor and the pleasure of advising the city on this project really since its conceptualization. And, um, you know, it, it's not only about um, exploring the possibility of a forward looking, more modern sort of uh, utility plant, but it's also really interesting about the way that this is being delivered. And I think that this is a really important thing. You know, traditionally with infrastructure projects, the city or the owner of the asset will will own all of the risks. You know there could be schedule delays, cost overruns, etc. But when, when the when the when the when the opportunity or the, the the question came to to the city about how best can we explore whether or not this project makes sense, the same question that that I helped to to to, to help the city solve was. Well, it's not only about answering the question of do you or do you not deliver the facility, but it's how you do it, right? Um, how can we do this in the timeliest and most cost-effective manner to the benefit of the public and the ratepayers? And so, the, the way this is being um, delivered is through a really innovative public-private partnership, and that that term has sometimes it raises ire of people because it means different things to different people. I, I often joke that the, the term P3 should probably just stand for PowerPoint presentation because that's all it's all it is now. Everyone talks about it in those terms. But public-private partnership is really a very generalized term. And, and the vernacular that we're going to be using in, in this project, it's really a long-term contractual arrangement between the city and a private entity, which in this case is Epcor Foothills um, Water Partners, um, to design build, finance, operate, and maintain the new facility. The new facility is owned by Lake Oswego. It's not a private facility. It's not privatization. It's actually owned, and it's it's on the property. It's on the, the ledger, the, the balance sheet of, of, of Lake Oswego. It's just being delivered through a, pub, a private partner who's going to design, build, finance, operate it over the long term. Um, what this does is that it transfers the performance risk of the asset from the city to the private partner. In other words, if their cost overruns at the time of constructing this, that's not on the city. The city will have agreed already what it's paying and that risk is on the developer, which in this case is Epcor Foothills Water Partners. Schedule delays. Epcor will not get paid until they deliver the infrastructure and it is operating at the prescribed levels. So you can't get a plant that's not working. Um, well, you can get one, but you're not going to pay for it. <laughs> um, so, so there's some protections embedded in this. And you see on the, the graphic on the right hand side, that's really the structure. So, so the way this works is the city of Lake Oswego, which is on top, will be the owner of the asset. And they're the ones that have contracted with Epcor. To the right, you have an intergovernmental agreement with Portland, which exists today. It's just kind of got to be updated to reflect the new ownership structure. 
But below and on the merits of, of a long-term design, build, finance, operate contract, you have foothills water. And what they do is everything that you would naturally or normally do through multiple contracts. Typically, the city would hire a designer. They would do the design. Then you hire a construction company. But wait, the designs are bad. I need more money. I need to adjust this and that. And so you have integration issues. But then also there's the O&M. If you design something that you have to take care of, you tend to design it well so that you can minimize a life cycle cost as opposed to designing it and not worrying about operating costs until the future. So, so the Epcor Foothills Water Partners team um, is, is not just one company, it's many companies. The, the main member is named Epcor, so we often abbreviate it and say Epcor, 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 but we're never meaning Epcor, the, the company, Epcor, we're meaning Epcor Foothills Water Partners, so the entire team, which also includes AECON as one of their, uh, their contractors, Felonc is involved as well, so they have multiple entities, and they will put together the financing for this through the use of private equity and the use of public debt or private debt for them, um, so, so they'll issue their own debt. They're going to try to probably, hopefully, get the WIFI loan, which is the lowest cost uh, financing that you can get for infrastructure projects. But the use of at-risk private capital also changes their behavior. By putting in their own money to build an asset that they don't own, their only recourse is to get repaid by the city over time. And so if they're not performing well, they're not getting repaid. And so it, it changes the behavior. So it's a really interesting, um, and it's, it's a quite tried and true in the United States. If you're following the infrastructure bill in Washington, um, there's an entire chapter dedicated to public-private partnerships. So this isn't as innovative and creative as it used to be. It's very standardized now. Um, but in this particular case, we think that it's the appropriate uh, methodology to, to proceed with this because you get to transfer a lot of the ownership risk away from the city and onto the contractor. If we can go to the next slide, um, I think that this process also is unique in that it's not just a public-private partnership. What we did, and, and to, to Anthony and Martha and everyone else's point, you don't want to make long-term decisions on bad based on bad information or imperfect information. And so the decision to proceed with a new plant versus the existing plant, um, you know, there's a lot of debate going on around, oh, always invest in something new. But really at the end of the day, I think the city, both cities took the wise approach to say, why don't we hold off on making a definitive decision until proof of concept is proven and we know what the price is going to be and we know if this is going to work. So what we did is that even though we like the, the public-private partnership approach to this, we created what's called a progressive P3 approach. And, and this is, a, Anthony talked about it a bit, but what it is is you have basically two phases of this project. The first phase is where we are today, which is on the left. And this goes through about July of next year. And this is what we call the preliminary services um, phase. During this phase, the city, um, together with EPCOR, EPCOR is doing most of the work the city is overseeing and, and reviewing, but they're doing the design development in a very progressive way. So they're doing a basis of design, then a 30% design, a 60% design, and then they'll give you their, their, their final price submittal. But on the basis of this, um, the city and, and the cities get good information in terms of the affordability. Will this fall within the threshold that Anthony has, has set out already in terms of will it fall in, in a consistent way with existing rate projections? Um, but also in terms of permitting, you know, this whole thing needs to be permitted by ODEQ, so the Department of Environmental Quality, and that's a long-term process. And if they were to say, look, we're not comfortable with the technology we need 10 years to approve it, then you may not opt for this technology. I don't think that's the case. We, we're very optimistic in terms of what we're seeing. But also in this process, you do schedule development in terms of EPCOR defining exactly how long it will take them to deliver the facility, financial structuring um, in terms of securing the, the WIFI loan or, or private placement debt and those sorts of things. So a lot of activity is going on. But the good news is that by July of 2022, um, if this looks viable, it will go to the council in a public meeting, and they will know exactly how much it's going to cost for the next 30 years. So, so it's not that there can be unexpected increases in the future, really. This is pretty much, this is the cost for the next 30 years. And you'll be able to analyze with, with great certainty whether or not this falls within the affordability threshold. At that point, if they proceed with a project, you go to the next phase, which is phase two, which is the project agreement or the P3 phase, where EPCOR, the EPCOR 
Bancorp team would finalize the designs and they would do the construction and then begin testing commissioning. And then we have a 30 year services period where they'll be operating the facility. Um, so, so it's a very methodological and very um, progressive approach to allowing the cities to make a decision based on full information instead of based on partial or, or, or let's call it imperfect information. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, and, you know, again, I think I said a lot of this already, but, but why is this approach right for, for Lake Oswego and, and Portland in that sense, even though Portland's a little bit more arm's distance from this? First of all, it allows for life cycle um, cost predictability, right? So I'm not following the bullet points in order, so you and the audience will have to figure out which one I'm talking to. Uh, but life cycle asset stewardship, you know, I often joke that uh, in the United States, we have many national pastimes, but from a public works perspective, our number one pastime is deferring maintenance. We like to kick the can down the pothole streets of, of, of America because we don't have enough money to, to invest uh, in a proactive manner. Through the P3 approach, we will prescribe the standards at which this plant needs to operate. EPCOR and its team will have to maintain it in that regard. If they have some deferred maintenance and they have to invest more in year 13 or year 25, that's on them. That's not on the city to compensate. So you don't have that irregular sort of EKG looking investment schedule or budget uh, where all of a sudden you have a spike because you need something. And so that allows the city to have greater predictability in terms of payments. Ratepayers can, can have a, a more moderate increase or a more moderate and predictable um, forward looking thing. So financial predictability is really important, but that's tied to the asset stewardship. It's because we're locking in life cycle maintenance on this over the next 30 years. We'll even know the condition that it needs to be turned back over to the city um, for operation at the end of this term. So we'll have useful life, residual life um, detailed within the agreement. Secondly, and I think this is a taxpayer and ratepayer very important, payments are tied to performance. If the facility is not working as it should, you will not be paying the full amount back to, to, to the team. I have full confidence that the upcore team is going to be able to maintain it at that. But it's, it's kind of like if, if you're paying a mortgage um, to your builder and the, the, le the roofs are leaking, you feel pretty bad about having to pay the mortgage if, if you're not being protected from rain. So, so in this case, if they're not delivering at the performance standards, you deduct payments to them. That incentivizes them to correct any, any, any deficiencies, but also it, it allows you to pay for what you're getting, right? You're actually paying for what you're getting and you don't start paying until you're actually receiving the benefit of the project. So another peeve that I have is that I, I, there's one project particularly right outside my window that I've been paying for my entire lifetime and I don't think it's going to be completed in my lifetime. <laughs> it just seems to last forever. It's literally a 50 year project at this point that is yet to deliver one ounce of public benefit. Um, the black hole of public works where you pay money, pay money and pay money in the hopes that future generations might benefit from it. That's not what this is. You will begin to pay for this project upon completion and when it's delivering the, the benefits. And so it ties payments to the performance of the asset, which is really important. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's increasingly the way we're, we're looking at infrastructure in the United States. Very importantly as well, we do very strongly believe that this will accelerate delivery by combining, you know, this design build process um, so, so EPCOR and its team, once it gets to its 60% designs, they'll start to fast track if there's an approval to go forward, the delivery process. So it, it generally saves about 25% in terms of schedule versus traditional design bid build. So that's also a good thing because once the decision is made, there's no need to, to pussyfoot around, get this thing done, get this thing operating. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, optimize risk allocation. Um, you know, it's, it's a sad truth in the United States and across the globe that, that the public sector often owns a lot of the contracting risk on these things. So cost overruns are paid for by the taxpayer, paid for by rate payers, et cetera. Through this P3 approach, um, we, we've basically transferred a significant amount of that risk to the, um, to the private entity, which in this course is the EPCOR team. And they're better positioned to handle it than the city. The city can't handle the construction 
um, process if they're not the ones actually lifting the hammer. So, so we think that this is a very good approach and um, it's certainly being tracked at a national as well as international level because of the uh, creativity that both cities have, have, have embraced in terms of delivering it through an alternative financing delivery structure. So I'll pause there because I see 10 questions in the chat and I hope they're all for Anthony and not for me. So. Um, yeah, I was going to say um, we have some questions now from um, Anthony's earlier talk and Kim, I thought maybe you could start with the the two ones that relate to the park. Oh, absolutely. And one of them just one of them just a comment, but uh, yeah, there's one question um, about any possibility to use some of that acreage for park trail type uses. I'll start with that. So, so the answer to that is. Uh, it's possible. Uh, it's, a, it's a question. It's something that the council is going to have to um, uh, decide and uh, what they what portions of that property they use and, and what they do with the property. And I think that's a, a decision that we're deferring. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of things we have to figure out first. Um, and, but uh, yes, I, I think I think that it's going to have to go to council and there's going to have to be a, a discussion on, on what the uses could be. And, and a Related question. Um, someone was interested to hear about how the city's other plans to extend the riverfront trails from George Rogers Park to Tyrone Cove and to Williger Trail may be impacted or benefited by this project. I can start that one too. Um, so um, uh, so the, the scope of where those improvements are is outside of, of where we're talking about making improvements. So they're, they're independent of one another. Um, and and there, is, there is no overlap or, or interconnection. However, one item that we will be looking at is um, uh, possibly doing a um, reuse of water for Foothills and George Rogers. And so there, we could possibly leverage pieces of right away that could be uh, uh, along that, that use. But anyways, that's, that's all I'll say on that. <laughs> Tam, right. I see we have, uh, Linda has her hand up, Tammy. Yes. And then we'll go saying. back to the chat. Yeah. Oh, Linda, you're on. Yeah, okay, uh, no, you're on. Lydia Lipman. Lydia. Yeah. Lydia, Thank sorry. You. Sorry. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I was excited to see that you were concerned about the neighbors because in fact we're your closest neighbor. Um, we are in Stamford Road area, which as you know is north of Tryon, Tryon Creek. Um, I am interested because this is such an important um, and environmentally sensitive area that we're building in as to whether you have had environmental studies and whether you are going to be using any floodplain to build this to build this project. And if you are, I'd like to really get to learn about how you intend to mitigate that. And, um, and also whether DEQ and FEMA are involved in this and at what stage we're going to have some answers about that because with climate change and the siding of foothills, as you all know, um, this is going to be a major issue. And I'm hoping that you are addressing it early in this process and not later in the process. And certainly for us at Stamford Road, there had at one, been, at one stage been talk about mitigating any use of floodplain by putting it to Try and Cove Park, which would be a real problem for us because um, during the last flood in, in the 90s, um, the biggest flood problem was overflow of Tryon Creek, not overflow of Willamette River. So all of these are issues that affect us and affect everybody concerned with the viability of foothills. And we'd like to be involved in that conversation and know how those aspects are being dealt with sooner rather than later. It's an exciting project. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your question. I'm gonna give uh, Lee Ward a chance to speak and uh, uh, I'll turn it over to, to him. I think he's gonna cover pieces of this presentation, but I think he probably can answer some of it right now. Thanks, Anthony, and, and thanks, Lydia, for those questions. <clears throat> Very good. Um, so that is one of the challenges we have to meet is uh, re to make the plant resilient. And that means not only, you know, floodplain issues and how do we build there. Uh, it means worrying about earthquakes and, and uh, taking that into account as well. Uh, and so we're looking at all of those things. We are working with DEQ and uh, FEMA. We have to work to FEMA requirements. Uh, for whatever we do on that site. 
Um, the site that we've chosen is, um, you know, just adjacent to the site of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a little higher ground. Uh, you know, it's not as, uh, as close to the river as the old plant. Um, and so we're looking at FEMA requirements uh, for the, the height that we have to build to and that sort of thing. Um, the city has laid out requirements for us to make sure that we build above a one in 100 year flood for the main treatment process and above a one in 500 year flood for all of our electrical components. Uh, and so definitely there are some requirements that have been placed upon the project to make sure that we are uh, taking into consideration, you know, the resiliency that we're going to, we, that we anticipate we're going to need uh, in the event of, um, you know, of worsening um, events due to climate change. So very much so. And to add, we've 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 done uh, early environmental studies and geotechnical studies as well. And to your point, um, uh, very very good question, and it's very much front of mind. And we've already had a lot of discussion, and there'll be a lot more to go on it. Hey Kim, you have two two questions in the chat. Uh, I well, I have I have a few. I've been getting uh, them sent directly to me as well. Oh uh, great. This one's more um, for Jill. Maybe it's talking about the P three um, agreement. Um, if EPCOR defaults or some way goes out of business early, um, is there a backup plan or how will the city handle its image? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I always say that the, the, the question that we always need to ask ourselves is what happens if everything goes south and you need to step in, right? And so again, the city will own this plant and I, Lee, please don't listen to this, close your ears. I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint you guys in a bad light for a second, but you know, if they were to be um, deficient and default on this agreement, the city can step in right away, can replace the operator, but there's, it's not only them, the lenders themselves who have lent the, the EPCOR team the money will step in and replace them as an operator so the question really becomes when do they default if they default during construction then we don't even have a plant built yet trying creek is still going to be operating right and so we would need to figure out if you continue with the project uh, there are a number of things there but very rarely would they default i think during construction they would finalize that and we won't shut down trying creek until there's proof of concept and the new the new uh, plan has been commissioned if it happens during the operating stage, then very easily is the owner of the asset, the city can step in, ask another operator to do it or do it themselves. So there'll be training as well of, of staff and whatnot so that people can understand how to work it. But it's um, as, as you're the owner of the asset, you retain all the rights to step in at any time. And this is what I didn't want uh, Lee to hear, but you can throw them out if you have to. You know, we don't see that often <laughs> in their financial consequences because they need to get paid back for their investment. But in the same sense, you, you always retain that right. And so uh, you're very well protected in a well done P3 agreement, which this will be, um, there'll be all kinds of protections for the city in that regard. And uh, a similar question, if there are any um, delays uh, with the construction, will there be any penalties? So yes, I, yes, it's it's. But think about things a little differently. Yes, there are liquidated damages in all of these contracts if if there's a significant delay, right? So they're going to give us a schedule if they don't hit that schedule. But on the flip side of this, remember one thing: the city isn't paying them to construct; it's only paying for the completed asset. So if they don't finish this in time. They're not getting paid. They're, they're using their own money. It's at-risk private capital. So they're incentivized to get this thing up and running as quickly as possible because only upon delivery of, of, of services will they begin to get paid. So, so they're, they're double, let's call it double slapped in the, in the event of a uh, scheduled delay or, or delay in delivery. On the first hand, they're not receiving um, the revenue that they were hoping to be able to repay their debt. So, so they're out over their skis and their lenders are yelling at them on one side. And on the other side, we have liquidated damages in the form of an LD, which is a very common thing in, in construction contracts that would come into effect that would start to penalize them. So yeah, we, we will hold them accountable. But let me just say, because now I've just thrown EPCOR under the bus two times. I represent the city, uh, but I have to say that, you know, EPCOR is, is, is is a very well respected and very well known um, P3 
P3 operator. And I think that, uh, you know, the city, when it did its procurement, um, had international interests. I mean, it was global interest, literally from all over the world. There were, there, were, there were teams looking at this. And I think that to a certain extent, um, they were very fortunate to get uh, the airport team under contract. And I think that um, it's a world-class team. Um, they, I've seen them operate in other projects. And, uh, you know, I, I often say that they're, they're, they're pretty much the gold standard. So I don't think as long as we do our jobs and, and develop a, a, a P3 agreement that is, you know, consistent with market principles and, def, and balanced in terms of interest, I don't think we're going to have to worry about a default or, or a bad uh, actor sort of scenario. But rest assured that the agreement that the council will need to approve will have all of those provisions and safeguards in it if a worst case scenario were to, to occur. Just to reiterate what Jill says, uh, our working relationship with Epcor so far has been Fantastic, and uh, uh, we've been very collaborative, and 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 um, and um, we're very lucky to have them on board. So I I appreciate you saying, Jill, and I just wanted to echo that sentiment as well. So Kim, I think um, we'll go on to the next session. But if there are more questions, we can um, bring bring them up at the time that we have at the end for more Q and A. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. With that, we will turn it over to Lee. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for uh, allowing me to be here tonight to, uh, to speak in front of you. Um, as has been mentioned by all of the previous presenters, um, there are a number of project requirements uh, that we have to work to. Uh, when we were introduced to the project, um, these were laid out by the city. It was very plain and clear that we had some, some tough hurdles to meet, um, some very tough requirements to make sure that we could meet. Uh, number one, uh, you know, in, in all of those was the affordability for customers, and Anthony has touched on that. Um, the existing plan, of course, requires those upgrades, uh, and, it, and so there's got to be money spent one way or the other, and we're looking at how to spend it more, most wisely within the project. Uh, the existing plant is located in a floodplain, uh, as Lydia brought up, and, uh, and that is a challenge for us, um, but there are some design measures that we can take to mitigate those things. Um, there are site constraints. Obviously, all the wastewater is directed uh, to that area. Um, if we were to, uh, we, we couldn't build a plant uh, away from that area uh, without some major, major cost to build pump stations and things to redirect that flow. So, you know, it's, it's very, make very, makes very much sense that we'd have to build uh, adjacent to the site or in that area. And as was mentioned earlier, the site is less than six acres. A very compact site, and we had to. Um, one of our challenges was to find out uh, a technology that could fit within that site. Um, the uh, the current current uh, permit for Tryon has expired. It did expire in two thousand nine. DEQ is very uh, interested in getting uh, a new permit um, in the hands of the new plant uh, operator. And so, um, you know, they are, they, they know of our decision. They know of the technology that we've put forward. We have been talking to DEQ and, uh, and they're on board with, um, you know, with, with trying to work towards getting this new infrastructure in, in, uh, in place. Next slide. Other project requirements that were very important um, laid out to us by the city, you know, the plant had to be energy efficient. Um, we, we had to come with some great ideas about how we were going to cut the electricity usage um, to the bare minimum. Climate change is, ta is on top of mind. Um, you know, we're all kind of reminded every time we see, you know, fires raging in California or we see, you know, floods happening across the world or, um, you know, those types of things that it, it is upon us and we have to uh, be mindful of that. Uh, sustainability, again, is top of mind at the plant. We want to be uh, not only efficient with our energy, but we want to be efficient in how we design the structure and how we integrate that structure into the community. Uh, the plant has to be reliable and resilient, able to withstand some of these uh, weather events that we're anticipating seeing. And of course, uh, we've all seen in the past uh, few months uh, the number of attacks on infrastructure across America. Um, you know, with, uh, with hackers um, holding uh, utilities for ransom. So that's very much top of mind for us too, and we've got to address that. Next slide. 
So when we did our analysis, we um, we looked we narrowed it down to two um, two different technologies. Um, as Anthony mentioned earlier, Aqua Narita is what we have put forward as the way we'd uh, recommend the city go. Um, it has gained a lot of momentum in the last few years, and uh, we've been talking to different plant operators across America that have just put these plants in, uh, and they're showing great results, and, um, and all of the uh, expectations that came along with choosing that technology are being recognized. So we're pretty satisfied that this is uh, definitely the way to go. Uh, next slide. So I think we want to just uh, just show you a short video, give you a, a little taste of what um, what Aqua Narita is all about. I'm going to stop sharing the presentation. We'll show you the video. In our world, the availability of clean water is an ever-growing challenge. Urbanization and population growth put a strain on land usage and the environment. Water quality is in jeopardy and treatment costs are rising. Conventional water treatment with activated sludge has been a tried and tested method for over 100 years. However, it has significant downsides, such as high chemical and energy consumption and poor settling sludge demanding large clarifiers, resulting in a large installation footprint. In the 1990s, a professor at Delft University of Technology took on the challenge of designing the ideal water treatment technology. This resulted in the development of Nareda technology. It can be applied in new plants but also used to retrofit existing ones. The core of Nareda technology is a unique aerobic granular sludge. All biological treatment occurs within the granules and in one tank without the need for energy consuming mixers, pumps, clarifiers or complex moving decanters. Nareda wastewater treatment works in batches consisting of three phases. The anaerobic fill and decant phase. Wastewater is introduced from the bottom of the reactor in a plug flow that pushes out the treated effluent from the previous batch from the top of the reactor using a fixed decanter. Organic pollutants in the wastewater penetrate into the granules and are partly transferred into storage biopolymers, while phosphate is released to the water phase. In the aerobic phase, the granular sludge is aerated. The released phosphate is taken up by the granules and biodegradable components are oxidized. Phosphor gets removed with the excess sludge. Ammonium in the wastewater is oxidized to nitrate on the outside of the granule. Bacteria deeper in the granule use the stored organics and biopolymers to convert nitrate into nitrogen gas. After this purification step, the granular sludge settles to the bottom of the tank and is then ready to receive a new batch. Thanks to the granules, settling takes place within minutes compared to over one hour in conventional activated sludge processors and SBRs. Excess sludge contains biopolymers that can be harvested and used as a sustainable resource for numerous agricultural, industrial, and construction applications. The benefits of Nareda technology are profound. Excellent effluent quality, easy operation and maintenance, significant savings in investment, energy, and chemicals, a footprint up to four times smaller. Existing tanks can often be retrofitted to Nareda, doubling capacity and improving treated water quality. Phosphate and biopolymers can be recovered as sustainable resources. Nareda, a proven technology that meets tomorrow's challenges in wastewater treatment.
Great. Um, thank you, Tammy. Next slide, please. So just a, a little more information um, kind of follows up on the video you saw, but I, again, this is, um, most plants are a continuous flow process. That means the water comes in one end, uh, flows through the plant and, and continues out the, through the back end once it's treated. Um, this is a little different approach where we call it a batch process. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the new raw wastewater comes into the, to the um, basin uh, pushing the uh, treated wastewater out the top. And so once that happens, we stop filling. We, uh, we turn the air on. Um, oxygen is transferred into the, um, into the sludge or the biomass um, where the treatment takes place. Uh, once we've uh, done that for a while, we take, turn the oxygen off. We let the uh, biomass settle down to the bottom. And then the same process happens again and again. Um, so very simple process, um, doesn't require, uh, you know, a whole, um, you know, 20 person workforce or anything like that. It's, it's very simple to, uh, to build and very simple to operate. Uh, on the right, you see the granule that they, um, that they showed you in the video. Um, typically in a wastewater treatment plant, uh, you have very many different basins, which have different environments in them, some with oxygen, some without. Um, you grow different uh, biological biomass in each of those basins to remove the particular constituent of concern with the wastewater. Well, in this plant, uh, it's one granule and it does the work of all of those different granules in one. Next slide. Anthony already showed you the site location uh, adjacent to the uh, Tryon Creek site. Next slide. So again, um, you know, the, the Tryon Creek wastewater treatment plant is closest to the river. We're looking at a site that's slightly um, higher up and elevated and away from the river. Um, and so it, it's really that site where you see that large white building. Uh, and that's the six acre site that we're, uh, we're contemplating um, locating the plant on. Next, next uh, slide. Uh, here is a picture of the floodplain. And this is a picture from 1996 when the when Lydia was experiencing the flood. And uh, so, yes, you can see that, you know, at, at this, and this was almost a one in 200 year flood, um, but it does um, penetrate that entire floodplain. Uh, and so there are measures to be taken to control that flooding. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing that we have to be aware of and work through um, as we progress the design. Next slide. The environmental benefits uh, are our major focus to us. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, there's four times less space used uh, compared to a typical wastewater treatment plant. Uh, again, this is the only way that we could fit it on a six acre, six acre site. Um, smaller physical, environmental, and carbon footprint um, by building this type of plant. Again, 50 to 60% more energy efficient than the most highly ranked. Um, next highly ranked technology, which was membrane bioreactor. Uh, there's less mechanical equipment. It's much simpler uh, to build and to operate than a, a standard wastewater treatment plant um, that is uh, to treat tertiary, to a tertiary level. Uh, produces very high quality effluent or treated wastewater, and which will satisfy the new permit requirements. Next slide. As I mentioned, it's the small carbon footprint. So when we did our analysis, we looked at a number of plants. The first thing we looked at is can it fit on, fit on, the, on the footprint? Um, we narrowed it down to um, the two technologies shown on the right of the top graph you're looking at, um, which both uh, take up about 25% of what you might see if you were to build a standard biological nutrient removal plant. And so uh, we narrowed it down to those two technologies. But then the, uh, the obvious um, winner um, and the reason Aqua Narita was picked uh, was because of the graph on the bottom, which demonstrates the energy usage. Uh, membrane bioreactor uses the most of any of those options. Um, Aqua Narita is, actually uses 40% of that. So very small carbon footprint, very low energy usage. Next slide. Um, one of the things we are tasked with is, uh, is building the plant to be resilient and reliable. 
Um, it will be designed with redundancy and backup systems. So if one pump uh, goes down because it uh, fails, there will be a, another pump to, uh, to start up. Uh, we'll be able to treat up to 53 million gallons per day through the secondary process. So that's the peak instantaneous flow that, that can be delivered to the plant. And we'll be able to treat that through our secondary process. Um, there will be standby power on site, so there will be a generator in the in the event that we lose main power, so that the plant can stay uh, operating through that period. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the main treatment units have to be built to withstand a one in hundred one in hundred year flood, and the main electrical room and electrical components have to be built uh, to withstand a one in five hundred year flood. Next slide. Uh, we are, uh, Lake Oswego is located within a seismically active area and, and obviously it's incumbent upon us to, uh, to, to design using the, um, you know, the standard codes um, in, for that area, for the Oregon area. So we will be incorporating that into our design as well. Next slide. All right, Lee, thank you so much. And um, Kim, I see we have questions in the chat. Um, we do. Uh, so just to clarify, the new technology would be Aqua Nareda. What is the existing technology? The existing plant is, um, is what we call a secondary treatment plant. Um, and so uh, uh, it's a standard conventional activated sludge plant um, and uses a combination of um, aeration basins and clarifiers. Uh, to uh, achieve the treatment um, that's necessary for, uh, for the current permit. Um, and so it's not quite as advanced as, uh, as the plant that we're um, looking at using in terms of um, meeting phosphorus and ammonia limits, but um, uh, still a very, um, a very good level plant, just not the latest technology um, and does require a number of, um, of improvements as we talked about earlier. All right. Um, with the Aqua Narita technology, how does it address nitrous oxide? So nitrous oxide is uh, is um, a byproduct of um, of wastewater treatment plants. Um, it is about um, three percent of the total contributor of, of nitrous oxide to the uh, atmosphere. The largest contributor is from agriculture, about eighty percent. Um, so it's a very uh, small amount. Um, however, it will be enclosed within a building. Um, you know, the process will be enclosed within a building. Uh, and, um, and so the amount of nitrous oxide that's actually released to the atmosphere uh, is very, very low um, compared to any other wastewater treatment plant or technology. Thanks, Lee. And I'm looking to see, I just don't see any hands. Uh, so we'll continue with the uh, questions from the chat. Um, unless Tammy, I think you might have somebody. Which we do have a hand raise. I just unmute Harold. Oh, wait, not okay. unmuted again. Here I am. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. Uh, probably some of it concerning the technology that I'm not quite clear on. Um, these, uh, um, I'm gonna call them balls because that's what they look like. Mm -hmm. um, are they recyclable or is that your, your waste product that you have to go and bury somewhere? Yeah, so uh, in any wastewater treatment plant, um, the, the aim is to remove um, the constituents out of the wastewater. And the, the, one of the largest constituents is actually organics and, and the solids that, uh, that, are, that exist within that wastewater. Um, and by, by settling out the solids, um, you're then left with, um, with what we call sludge. Um, so that sludge from time to time is wasted out of the plant. Um, you know, it gets old after time and loses its effectiveness in treatment. Uh, it gets removed out of the plant, and um, and then uh, we we call that um, when we do the treatment on it, we thicken it up. We um, we remove the water, and typically, um, what happens in the in the Portland area is that the the sludge is then digested, and then that digested sludge is 
taken and uh, applied to farmland uh, in Central Oregon. So uh, it, it, in some localities, in some municipalities, um, the, first, um, the first place they look to get rid of it is a landfill. But in Oregon, um, there's a lot of land application happening. And it's actually a product that farmers are looking for uh, more and more these days. Hey, Kim, there's some more chat. Yes. Um got a question here um, that asks that they're concerned about effluent standards um, that might become more stringent in the future. Um, so what standards of dissolved species of, uh, I think, nitrogen and potassium phosphorus will phosphorus. be achieved? It's been a long time slipped on the periodic table. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we don't have the new permit in hand yet um, from Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, so we, we don't know the final, final numbers, um, but um, we do know that those numbers will be more stringent than the current permit. And so we, this plant will be able to meet the new stringent or more stringent uh, removal requirements for, uh, for nitrogen, ammonia, and phosphorus. Um, and so we anticipate that there will be no problem in, in, uh, in meeting that uh, through, through the use of this technology. And Harold had a follow-up question. Yeah, I, I have a couple quick questions. Um, if these uh, ball, the manufacturer goes away, what are we what are we left with? Is this something that more than one company manufactures, or are we attached to uh, to this current manufacturer by an umbilical cord here? Good question, Harold. And uh, so. This, this is actually quite unique. Um, this is called aerobic uh, granular sludge. Um, and so it's actually grown. Um, you can grow this in your own wastewater treatment plant in the basins that we will be building from conventional activated sludge. Uh, it's really about creating the right conditions to do that. And so um, we'll be able to do what we call seed the plant um, you know, in, in a large way from, um, we anticipate from sludge right at Tryon Creek. And so, and so then we'll, we'll seed the plant and we'll be able to grow the, uh, or the granular sludge that will be, um, you know, the basis for uh, the treatment that we can do in the new plant. So no, we're not reliant on a, on a, a manufacturer to provide us, you know, uh, these new granules from, you know, from somewhere in Europe or something like that, not the case. And Kim, do you have more questions in the chat? I do, one more. Um, allowing for future expansion, how long is the plant planned to be operating at full capacity? Well, the plant, uh, we're looking at a 2055 window um, for the design of the plant. Um, the, um, the current, um, the current flows, uh, aren't as high as they will be in 2055. Um, we anticipate some growth, um, you know, in, in Lake Oswego, not a lot because Lake Oswego is, is built out quite a bit, but, um, the surrounding areas, uh, there will be, we anticipate some growth, um, but the plants, um, uh, design capacity will be designed for 2055. Thank you, is that it, Kim? Uh, for questions about, um, yep, the technology. All right, um, let's go to um, some more electronic polling. And Libby, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first poll, or do you wanna discuss it first? No, we just, um, there's a series of questions here too. So the um, guiding principles, um, project values, um, we're interested in getting feedback um, from, from all of you about which of the guiding principles values are most important. So Tammy, if you wanna start the poll. There we go. And I'm launching the poll. So um, the first um, guiding principle, um, clean water. 
So on a scale of one, extremely important, to five, unimportant, how important is producing clean water? I can see extremely important is winning the race here. Yeah. Yeah, extremely important and important. We're at 100% for Great. both of those together. Yeah, and the poll. All right. And share the results. Okay, 75% extremely important and 25% important. Thank you, Tammy. Go to the next question. And I'm gonna launch the poll. The second one is energy efficiency. And again, the same scale, uh, one extremely important uh, to five unimportant. All right. End the poll. Okay, and um, this again a high um, a high value forty one percent extremely important fifty three percent important I can do math that's ninety four percent so another um, high ranking value. The next one, Tammy. And I'm launching the next poll. And this is about uh, resiliency. Um, we was discussing that same uh, same scale. And I'm going to end the poll. Um, again, much like uh, clean water, uh, resiliency has a, a high score here, seeing 100% um, between the both, just like clean water. Okay, we have two more. Two more questions to go. I'm going to launch the next poll. Okay, um, being a good neighbor, Anthony talked about um, some of the ways that this uh, facility is going to be a good neighbor on a scale of one, extremely important to five, unimportant. How would you rank this? All right. And the poll. All right. So a little more of a mix um, here, um, 39% and 39% for important and extremely important. Eight. And then the last one we're going to pull on is affordability. And I've launched the poll. And I'll end the poll. Okay. Um, this one has a, a much broader range of, um, of importance to our attendees. Um, so 31% extremely important, 50% um, important. So um, I've been keeping track of the, of the results and I would say that what well, I can see here, the top three are clean water, energy efficient, and and resilient. So thank you for that input. Go to the next question, Tammy. Did you share the results for the affordability? Yes, I did. Okay, it's on my screen. Um, um, based on what you've learned tonight um, from this presentation, what are you interested in learning more about? And this will be useful for us as we're working on public engagement and education. So, you know, um, this is also what you're interested in learning more about, but what you also think your friends and neighbors might be interested in learning more about. 
So it's the wastewater treatment facility project, the P3 that Jill talked about, um, water quality and the treatments that Lee talked about, good neighbor features, resiliency features, that's earthquake and flooding, energy efficient or other. Um, and this one, you can pick as many as you, as you like. Because we know from Anthony that all of these are very interesting. So. I'll give a little bit more time here. Right. And then we can wrap it up. There we go. I'm going to end the poll. And then let's see the results here. All right. So um, the, the project as a whole um, has the most interest at 61, and, um, but also public-private partnerships and uh, water quality. Thank you. All right, Jill. Yay. Okay. Now I'm going to stop sharing. All right. And we have another question. I'm going to launch the poll. And, and this is also going to help us um, so that we can advertise um, future events, that, you know, the best possible way. So how did you hear about this information? We're very happy you're here. Um, what was the way that you heard about that? We heard about this event. And I'm going to give it a little second and then wrap it up here. Yeah, a few more. Oh, yeah, and there's word of mouth down here. Scroll through. Alrighty, I'm going to end the poll. Okay, thanks, Tammy. Share All right. Results. Oh, so that's great. So um, email invitation at 34%. That is a, a great return. And also the postcard and city, the city council meeting. So thank you very much for your help with that. Okay. Is that the last one? That's the last one. That's the last one. Okay. All right. So next up, we had said there'd be more time at the end of the presentation to um, have more um, questions or comments. And I know, Kim, you've been saving some. So why don't we start with the ones that you, you saved? Yeah, I've got one. Um, how much um, will or has the city spent um, before deciding to go with the P3 approach? I'll start taking a, a, a attempt at that one. Um, so, um, uh, so the preliminary agreement uh, uh, portion is uh, estimated to be about seven million dollars. Um, uh, um, Epcor Foothills Water is actually um, um, fronting most of that money, or actually all of that money for the, for that piece, um, uh, and then we will um, put it into our overall project agreement and and pay them back over time. Um, and um, um, so that's that's the amount uh, we are currently um, about. Um, I think it's leave me correct if I'm wrong. What two point seven million dollars in, into that uh, as of um, as of the end of August, um, and um, uh, and then we also have some money that we've spent on um, uh, consulting so far. So uh, during the whole preliminary services period, I think it's estimated about one point four million dollars total, um, and um, um, we've spent um, um, about. Uh, Hundred thousand dollars of that. Plus, there was some money that was spent before uh, we got the preliminary service period. There was about a hundred fifty thousand dollars in a feasibility study, and then also some consulting. Uh, I think it, that also came out to be close to about a million dollars total. So, anyways, I, I know I'm just I'm, from top of my head. I think that's pretty close, you know. So, uh, Lee and, and Anthony, did you want to mention that that's being shared with the city of Portland? Oh, that's a huge point. Yeah, so we have an agreement in Portland that we're splitting it. 50-50 um, should the project not occur, which we're, we're, we're uh, feeling pretty optimistic at this point that it will occur. Um, uh, and that, uh, but then it will be based upon affluent um, usage. So currently Portland uses about 65 or 35% of, uh, of of affluent use and we use about 65%. Um, and so that would be the splits of, of all those costs I just, just mentioned. Um, so anyways. Anthony, if I can just 
clarify a little bit more as well. Um, so, so I think it's a really good question, but I think Anthony mentioned it, but in case people didn't didn't catch it. Um, so out of pocket, the city has paid some consultants um, a certain amount of money, but the work that EPCOR is doing, um, EPCOR is, is using its own capital. And that, that, that investment, consider it kind of design work, will be incorporated into the 30-year payment structure if the project goes forward. Um, so, so nothing is out of pocket yet from the city in that regard. If the city decides not to proceed with the, with the project, then depending on the timing of when they decide that, there will be a payment to EPCOR for the services they provided. Um, but if it goes forward, that will be incorporated within sort of the rate structure that you already saw. But out of pocket, which I think is important because the city doesn't have a whole lot of free cash lying around. Um, again, that was sort of the pro progressive structure of this was to um, allow EPCOR to finance the progressive period or the, the preliminary services period, which would then be rolled into the rates. So. You probably said it better than I did, Anthony. I just wanted to reiterate. No, I think I think you captured it, and I, I looked it up while we we're talking. So uh, it's 1.2 million is how much we spent out of pocket, really, for consulting, uh, and, and that's the actual money that the city has paid at this point. Uh, then, with everything Jill said, is also true. So, yep. All right. Thank you. Are there any more questions before we go to closing remarks? Oh, I see. Oh, they uh, are. I, Here I, they come, Kim. I have a few more questions in the in the queue. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Uh, if you have any information on how the lands near the Tryon Creek um, plant will be restored and how other lands will be mitigated during the plant relocation. I can start that and then I'll, I'll put it over to Lee after. Uh, so, um, so as part of uh, actually uh, EPCOR Fort Hill Water Partners uh, scope of work, uh, they need to uh, uh, look at the remediation and, and demolition of, of the plant. So we anticipate having more information of that when we get closer to uh, the, the spring of 2022. Um, so Lee, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. We, we won't know exactly what the, uh, the scope is, um, we, as part of the project, we will have to decommission the uh, existing wastewater treatment plant, um, you know, and that means transfer flow over to the new plant, uh, transfer it away from the old plant, and then, uh, you know, turn off all the systems and decommission all of the systems at the old plant. Um, we will, towards um, the end of, or the beginning of the new year, we will be starting to look at uh, a demolition plan for the plant. And so we'll identify all of the uh, issues, all of the actions that have to be taken to demol demolish the plant and to remediate the, uh, the property. Uh, that will include, you know, environmental studies, making sure that we've dealt with everything um, that we have to deal with in an appropriate manner and putting together a cost and letting the city know what, the all, what that is uh, along with that report. So. Tammy, I think we have some hands raised. We'll go to the hands up. And we have O'Neill. Is the name on the thing? Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, when will the people, the, the rate payers and their representatives know what the comparative costs were or are going to be between this new plant and the existing plant upgraded, maybe even to tertiary standards. I, I can start that. So uh, as I mentioned in my slide about rate comparisons, uh, projected rates are the same for either option, the existing upgrade or the new plant. Um, however, there's due diligence. We have to, to make sure that that is actually the case. And we will know that in uh, uh, June of of around there of 2022, uh, we uh, it's looking that way, and so but we need to. There's a lot more work, a lot more information we have to get to confirm all of that. Um, and then we also think long term over the whole cost of the project, we think it's going to be uh, less than the cost to upgrade the existing plant. But we also need to confirm that too. But the city of Portland will give you precise co compared to apples to apples costs. Is that correct? 
Y yes, so they, they have given us uh, the cost that they believe it will be to upgrade over the over the course of the next 30, 30 years. Uh, uh, not only that, only the cost that they've done now, and they've actually done quite a, some some design work. Uh, uh, and actually, Jim, I don't know if you want to jump in and to give more details, but uh, you know they they've 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 scoped out quite a bit. Um, so uh, uh, we have what it will cost to pay Portland on an annual basis, and we designed the payment structures to EPCOR around that. Uh, so that's why the rates are the same, is that we um, we are making sure that the payments uh, and the way that it's structured are, are uh, the same or less over the, every year over the course of the project. Thank you. Anthony, I think you had that without my assistance. Thank okay, you. Okay, okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the cash flow projection was based on the projected 30-year CIP. And that would include multiple future year projects uh, in, in out years to upgrade the, the existing facility to provide nutrient removal and do some of the stuff that new plant will do from day one. Very good, thank you. And Jim, Jim works for the city of Portland. He is he is there uh, one of the managing engineers and he's actually one of the ones that was involved in doing uh, doing that work. Uh, and his, so, yep, thank you. All right, Kim, let's go back to a chat question and then we'll um, come back to Harold. Great, uh, so we have a question. Do you have any data on the efficiency of the new technology compared to the old in removing antibiotics and isotopes? Yeah, I can take this, Anthony. Very good. So uh, there have been some recent studies done uh, in terms of not, not specific um, technologies, but different levels of treatment. And so, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, you have primary treatment plants, uh, secondary treatment plants, and then you have tertiary treatment plants. Um, the data from those um, recent studies suggests that 88% uh, of, um, of those type of um, uh, emerging contaminants um, would be removed through a secondary process, uh, and up to 94% would be removed through a tertiary process um, without even looking at the specific process itself, but just the fact that uh, you're going to that extra level of treatment. Um, so, you know, th that's some recent studies that point to some numbers. Jim, I don't know if you have any more data on that, but. I think you're on mute. Yes, I had a little. Uh... A mute problem there. No, I don't have any interest in any uh, different data than that. But uh, I know that conventional treatment technologies have, have a very difficult time with uh, um, contaminants of concern. All right, Tammy. Um, yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the um, rate question. We really haven't gotten an estimated percentage increase and we just had a large water uh, supply and huge increase in the last couple of years. Um, and here's my concern. I have looked up EPCOR and seen some of the other facilities they've had like in um, Arizona, there I think there was one in California and there were um, a slew of complaints of the increases once EPCOR has been in position for a short period of time and the other complaints, which was like 50 some complaints out of 50 some comments was that um, the, uh, the service that you provided to your customers was, was low grade. Um, I'd like to know, number one, what assurances we have that the rates won't instantly or, or soon thereafter start to skyrocket, even though Lake Oswego is mostly populated with affluent people, it's not 100%. Uh, some of these bills can really hurt a, a, a household. And what assurances do we have that the service that you provide um, will not get 50 out of 50 some uh, reviews that say that it, it's not up to standard. I can take that, Anthony. Um, Harold, I think the two communities you're talking about or you're referring to in Arizona 
our communities that uh, that EPCOR inherited from a previous uh, previous provider. Um, they had um, not maintained the infrastructure. This is one of the things with P3s that uh, that won't allow what happened in Arizona to happen in Lake Oswego. Um, so they had not maintained the infrastructure over the past 20 years, um, and the infrastructure was uh, was in dire need of upgrading, and, and it was actually starting to lead to some water quality concerns and things like that. And so EPCOR brought forward a capital plan uh, that the what was, was um, approved by the Arizona regulator um, to do uh, improvements to the system for public health um, reasons. And so um, the, uh, the people in the community who were uh, used to extremely low water rates because their water system was falling apart, um, you know, it was a shock to them to have to pay for improvements to their system. Uh, even though some of the complaints you're talking about from customer service point of view were caused by the fact that there were water quality issues and things like that in the community because of the old infrastructure. And so uh, even with the capital improvements that EPCOR put forward and said, we'll fix the system, um, they still have paid less or no more than the average of all of the communities in Arizona. So there are a lot of specifics to, to what you're talking about, Harold. Um, and so we can confidently say that EPCOR uh, does strive for high customer service, um, you know, and it, with the P3 in Lake Oswego, the, um, the, the contract that Jill was talking about will ensure that the rates can't go up. The rates, so the, the contract is set for 30 years, the payments are set for 30 years, and as Jill said, if things start falling apart, if, if equipment has to be replaced, if we don't meet performance standards, EPCOR doesn't get paid anymore. Um, we get paid what the original uh, payment structure was agreed upon with the city of Lake Oswego. So. Yeah, if I could okay. add to that, um, just, just to elaborate a little bit further. So um, I work on the city side of this ledger. So I'm, I'm representing the city and advising Anthony and, and, the, and the team in, in Portland as well on this. Um, look, there are always going to be examples where rates go up. This contract is being structured in a way that to at least point it cannot, right? So, so they're, they're, they're not, EPCOR is not in charge of setting rates. Um, it's the city that sets the rates and there's a established, um, you know, projection already there. So we can guarantee you that EPCOR can't come in and set the rates because they have no legal right to do so. Um, so. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing in terms of performance, as I mentioned before, the contract is being devised um, will penalize EPCOR for performance shortfalls. An accumulation or, per, or persistent um, shortfall in terms of performance would mean a trigger to be able to terminate the contract. So, so we have in good provisions there. Again, I, I, I think in my experience, 50 complaints for a utility, I probably complain 50 times a week to my utilities. <laughs> so so, so I, I feel for utilities because if anything's wrong, we, we all tend to do that. But um, all I can say is that the contract that we are working on right now is designed um, to protect the public interest um, from any of those eventualities. And, and, and to the person who asked the question, it's a really good question to ask. I think it's the right question to ask, but this contract would not even allow EPCOR to raise the rates, um, first of all. And secondly, we'll have performance protections in there um, that we can discuss even further as we get closer to the uh, to the June date of, of a decision as to go or not go. But um, a good question, but I think Lee answered his part. I just want to assure everyone the contract is written would not provide a poll with any opportunity to raise rates. So, um, Last thing, can I add one more small point? Yeah. Uh, so the, I think, I'm pretty sure, Harold, you're referring to the Better Business Bureau and the 50 complaints. And Lee, how many customers do you have? Um, how much did EPCOR have? Uh, <laughs> tough question. Um, over 2 million customers. Okay. So that gives you, that gives you a scale. So, all right, Libby. Um, I just was going to say, Kim, um, how about, um, asking the question about Portland on the chat, and then we will go to closing remarks. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the question is, how will Portland's expansion in community, and I, I believe it, they mean increase in population, um, affect the capacity of the plant? Anthony, I think I can go ahead and answer that. Yeah. I would Thank say that you. the, so the, the new facility is utilizing the flow and loading projections that were prepared uh, for the upgrades and really rehabilitation of the existing facility. So the uh, flow and load projections from the uh, Portland component of the service area um, reflect the uh, uh, comprehensive plan and the land use planning for the areas that are tributary to, to the Tryon Creek facility. So those are already included in the projections of future flows uh, at the, um, the 2055, I believe it was, planning period for the, uh, uh, the P3 replacement facility. Thank you very much. Um, and now we're ready for um, closing remarks. Um, beginning with May Mayor Buck. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Um, I just want to start off by giving some thanks to uh, Anthony Hooper and our city team, plus the city of Portland and our other partners on this project for the very efficient work they've been doing together. And then tonight, um, a thank you to our facilitators, Libby Kim and Tammy. You all did a, a wonderful job. And thank you to you community members for coming. I have to say, I was so surprised to see uh, so many of you here and looking through the list. Um, I see so many names of our neighborhood leaders, uh, members of some of our advisory boards, like the Sustainability Advisory Board, our budget committee members, um, other sustainability and environmental leaders, neighborhood leaders in the town. And you all had so many great questions. Great, great, great questions. Um, and as you heard, there's going to be many future decisions that will need to be made. And uh, those decisions are all going to be made with uh, community input um, as we're thinking about how to best serve both our current and future residents of the community while also being good stewards of the natural environment and continuing to create a community with the doors you know, open to all. So I just ask that you all please, um, thank you for being involved now and continue to be involved in the future because we definitely, we need these questions. And we as a city council uh, and the city are going to need uh, your input as we faced many decisions that down the road, not just on this plant, but you can see some of these ancillary benefits that this new project uh, is going to engender, uh, both in the environmental benefits, energy conservation, and then how we'll be able to best utilize valuable land in the, in the foothills and, and surrounding properties for uh, future generations of, of Oswegans. Um, I heard you all loud and clear on uh, values for this project in energy efficiency, producing clean water, uh, being a good neighbor and being resilient. Um, when it comes to infrastructure projects, Lake Oswego has really been leading the way, you know, whether it's um, the groundbreaking Lake Oswego Tigered Water Partnership, uh, which is Oregon's, uh, has a, the uh, first and only seismically safe water infrastructure um, in, in, in the state, or our new city hall, Boone's Ferry Road, the city's been thinking outside the box, and sometimes that makes us a little uncomfortable, new technology and, 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 and whatnot, um, and it's the same here, right, as we explore Aqua Narita, it's a, a first in our state. Um, technology, but we have an opportunity here to create a safer, healthier uh, community uh, for everyone. Uh, we're fortunate, you know, that the circumstances align here the way they do, that we have land um, available to us, um, and that we have uh, great partners and wonderful minds um, on, on, on this project. And I hear some of the questions, and in, in a way, it almost sounds too good to be true. And I hear you on that, because I had to have Anthony explain this to me about 10 times uh, before I uh, could almost not believe um, what a great project we have uh, before us. Um, and uh, we had a study session as a council on this last week and, um, and now tonight, and I, I think by the end of this, I, I, I never thought I would uh, know as much about aerobic granular sludge as I'm going uh, to know going through uh, this project, but, but it is great. Um, and with your input, we're going to continue um, uh, moving forward with a technology that aligns with our community values and will set future generations uh, up for success with this incredibly important project. And I think it's safe to say that uh, this project, it will be nice for us to be uh, knowing uh, more for our effluence instead of our affluence. I couldn't help myself with the wastewater puns, you know, the, and they will just keep coming. Okay, so, um, and with that, I'm joined by uh, two of my colleagues here tonight, uh, Councilor Winland and Councilor Manns, but I have um, the honor of turning things over now to Councilor Manns. Thank you everyone again. 
Why, thank you, Mayor. That was hardly a waste of your breath. In. <laughs> thank you. Um, I can only, I'll keep this short and sweet. I can only echo everything that the mayor said. In addition to which, one of my um, goals in both my many, many years of work on the water treatment plant from soup to nuts from the beginning and all that went along with that to our current operation is that I was looking for sustainability. And when I say sustainability, I'm kind of a, an OG. I'm an old school person. I look at uh, people, place, and profit. And I use that profit in, in the loosest term, meaning that we're going to give people, you know, uh, employ people. People will have jobs. I think this particular project achieves all of those. I'm extraordinarily excited that we can be a line leader, if you will, in helping to um, help our environment. I mean, we, we have talked the talk for a long time and now it's time to walk the walk. I know it won't be inexpensive. I know we're going to run into to issues or complications as we move around. But given the team that we have, and I wanna give a shout out to Anthony, to Jill, to uh, Lee, and to our facilitators and everyone else, and I wanna say hundreds and hundreds, but I don't know that there are that many who are making this happen. I feel 100% confident that what we're doing for our city as well as for Portland uh, and for the river and for our community and for our environment is absolutely the right thing. The best part is that we'll, we'll be able to keep costs down because I too, like someone else had mentioned, really don't want to see my utility bills go up any further. So to all of you who came here tonight to learn more about this, thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Mayor Buck, for your great words and all the great questions. And I now will turn it over to Councillor Wendland. Thank you, Councillor Manns, and thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I echo my colleagues' comments 100%, uh, although I'm not as entertaining as Joe, but, uh, Folks, we have the biggest capital project in Lake Oswego's um, history, I think, when we get through with all this, it's, I don't know, around $300 million between capital and operating costs and so on. And so this is a big decision. Uh, we've got to get it right. Now, I know it's a small kind of project for Portland, but even it's, you know, even in Jim's words, they're looking at this as maybe being a possible future uh, project for, um, for their other plans. So uh, we need to get it right. Um, and it's also one of those have to do projects that nobody really wants to deal with sewer treatment, but people rely on this service every time they flush. And so again, we've got to get it right. and We can't have uh, problems moving forward in the next uh, 30 to 50 years. So we have the chance, I think, what I'm most excited about is to change the paradigm of how we're dealing with uh, our sewage treatment. Uh, and it's going to be better for Lake Oswego and Portland residents. Uh, and so how are we changing the paradigm? I think you've heard it tonight, uh, three big major ways. Uh, one of the things is we're flipping the operating agreement to Lake Oswego from Portland. So that's a big paradigm change. Uh, and so we'll be the main operator or responsible for operating and working with EBCOR to, to operate it. So that's going to be, be a paradigm change for us, but I think it's a very smart move. We also have a fabulous, wonderful relationship with Portland we have for a long time. and that will continue. The other change is that we're going to be using a new treatment technology, which uh, I was in a lot of uh, pre-meetings uh, in the process. Uh, and uh, I'm thoroughly convinced that uh, the aqua nervita uh, processing is going to be the best uh, possible uh, method for us to use. It's also going to be uh, a treatment technology that's more state-of-the-art, uh, energy efficient. Uh, and at the end, uh, both Lee and Anthony can drink water out of the uh, end result with confidence that it's going to be clean water. So 
uh, that's a big, huge plus from, from where we're at. And then the third part is really we're shrinking our footprint uh, down in Foothills. Uh, it's going to be an enclosed facility. And we talked about being a good neighbor. It's just going to be a huge uh, improvement when we get done with this project. And so uh, I'm, I'm very confident. Uh, I'm, you know, we still have some work to do. Uh, but uh, I have to tell you, I've been working with this team. There's a number of other consultants that are on this call uh, that, uh, you know, between Jill and Jim and, and um, uh, others that, uh, Dan, um, uh, they, we have the A-team folks that are working on this project and they're all led by Anthony Hooper, who has a proven track record in our city for doing great things on time, on budget and in creative ways. So uh, I'm just super excited that we're moving forward. Uh, I think Lee has been a fantastic partner with us, with EBCOR. He's been leading us through this process as well. And uh, I'm, I'm excited and I just want everyone to know that, hey, there's still more work to be done, but we are on the right path and um, we will be able to flush with confidence moving forward. And so, that's the, the closing comment. Oh, you're making me flush. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much, Tammy. One, one last slide. A, a big thank you to everybody. And um, Katie, um, did you want to say where people can learn more and find the summary report? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Nice meeting. Thanks, yeah. Libby. Yeah. Um, thank you for those closing remarks, M Mayor Buck and, and Councillors Manns and Wenlin. That was that was fantastic. And um, as as many of you probably know, we do have um, a great uh, website with lots of resources on there. A copy of this video, um, oh, sorry, this meeting will be um, uh, posted onto the city's YouTube channel, and we'll post it then also on the project website. Um, and I, I believe some of you have already registered, um, signed up to our e-newsletter. Um, and so we can, we can add folks onto there. Um, you can sign up on, on the website there. And we also have uh, an email address um, where you can send questions and, and, um, and comments. Um, we'll be posting um, all of our information on that website, um, you know, especially upcoming opportunities, as we mentioned before about uh, the next information session neighborhood meeting we have. Um, followed by our open house, which will probably be an online open house sharing the 30% designs um, and, and um, other upcoming, upcoming opportunities. Um, so really appreciate all of you coming tonight. Um, I think we've all been um, blown away by everyone's um, attendance and questions and, uh, and interest. I think that's, it's exciting. It's a big project. Um, Lake Oswego has had a lot of big projects over the last couple of years. Um, so um, this is this is the next one, and and it's exciting. So um, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Libby. But just yep. appreciate all the time that that you've all spent tonight. Um, looking forward to working with every one of you um, in the future as well. Yep. Well, I'd like um, Anthony to say we're adjourned. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And if you want to relive the memories of tonight, I will post it on our website so you can rewatch this video. And uh, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. All. And now we're officially adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>